Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar today. My name is Chris, and I'm a senior manager of product management at Unity. Prior to this role, I worked at Atlassian and Autodesk. Today, we're going to talk about our favorite topic, prioritization. And I want to introduce you guys a theory of prioritization method that can be used in various cases in your day-to-day -day life. Before we get started, I would love you to take a moment and then to think about what is the prioritization method that you use most often? And what are the locations that this method works really well? And what are the locations that it doesn't? What problems are you trying to solve during that prioritization? Is that always a conscious problem? Or is it sometimes a vague problem you are trying to solve? And are the problems always the same? Or do they vary between these different situations? I'm gonna pause here for maybe one minute to give you the space to think, and then we will resume. Alrighty, let's take a look. So I'm sure um, most of you have some of, of the favorite prioritization method in mind. And then here is a few of those common ones that we use. For instance, stack ranking. I'm sure you know this is the most basic and the most commonly used approach that many of us use on a day-to-day -day basis. Feature bucket, Moscow, buy a feature, value versus cost. If some of those um, feels foreign or unfamiliar to you, that's totally okay. We're gonna go through some of those, uh, but these are some of the most commonly used methods in the industry. So I ask you to take a moment to think about these because um, I want you, re you to revisit when you use that prioritization method, was that a conscious choice or not? Meaning that, did you use data to support your prioritization? How was the decision made? Was that something that you could make the decision after that prioritization? Or did you have to incorporate opinions from other people? Or was it occasion that it's completely determined by others? And how did you consider dependencies? Did you need to consider dependency at all when you're prioritizing? And after you prioritize those features, who are you communicating with? And how is that communication done in your situation? So depending on the answer of each of those questions, you should probably pick one of the prioritization methods on the list or potentially others. In many cases, what, we, what I realize or what we realize is that the choice of a prioritization method is not conscious. We typically defaulted to the ones that we know um, we know well and then keep using it consistently. There's nothing wrong about being consistent. However, when your situation varies, especially when your project or your product and your stakeholder group changes, you should consider using something slightly different. It turns out there is this periodic table of prioritization methods. And um, this periodic table gives us a framework in terms of uh, what are the factors we should consider? And when we're considering them, what are the methods available um, in our tool belt to choose from? So on the horizontal axis, this is um, the qualitative measurement, meaning internal versus external. This is talking about your stakeholder group, and this is also talking about how your decisions will be made. Is that going to be completely made by you or your small team, or is it something that's going to be completely made by other people or outside of your team? So that's internal versus external. On the vertical axis, this is about uh, whether you have data to support your decision making. Do you have quantitative data, which is high up, versus do you only have qualitative data, which is um, lower on the y-axis? 
So uh, you can see the ones, the coordination method, we, uh, I called out pre in the previous slide, um, the, they reside in different places on this periodic table or on this uh, matrix. For instance, stack ranking, feature bucket, those are very internal and um, qualitative validation methods. They work really well when you can get into agreements and then you talk about the, their relative importance among themselves and then give them a label. Versus some of the methods like Moscow, it's very external. It works super well when you're communicating with people that outside your team or even sometimes outside your company. And some other methods like buy a feature or value versus cost would require you to do upfront investment in um, getting data, uh, getting quantitative measurements before you can get into presentation. So we're gonna keep using this, um, for, uh, this periodic table through the session. And I will walk you through a few of those examples and why they reside in this relative location on this matrix. Uh, it's not to say that you cannot use stack ranking for your external stakeholders. You can't absolutely do that. Um, the, the reason why they reside on this table is to say that um, in many cases or in most cases, they would fit better um, with certain characteristics. Alrighty, let's take a look at um, this example. So this is the case where I am a restaurant owner and I want to start a restaurant website. And I have a list, um, I have a list of wishes I want to accomplish by doing the website. So uh, I want to have a text view of the menu. I want to uh, add images, gallery views, of the, the menu if customers prefer. I want to have the ability to change the menu items in my admin panel without having to engage another designer or other people. I want to have the ability to feature items on my menu as today's special. I want to um, incorporate an online ordering system for takeout. And um, I can have a text only contact us page if customers want to call me. But also potentially if we want to go fancier, then I have a contact us form routing the submission to my email so I can go back to the people who ask questions online. And uh, if I have people staffing my uh, online contact, then maybe we can even have online chat. I can use the Facebook business uh, contact, business messenger, or I can use something like intercom. So this is the long list of wishes I have for my website. And how do we prioritize this? In this case, uh, most likely as a restaurant owner, I'm not going to have technical expertise to determine that how much they cost and then whether those are feasible uh, or something like this. I would work with someone who has better experiences, have better knowledge about building websites. So the way I communicate my requirements is to say, some of those are must have, some of those are things that should have, some of those things that uh, we could have, or those are nice to have things. And some of those things are too difficult based on my conversation with other people so that I, I would decide to postpone them. Uh, so I label them as won't have. In this case, you can see that the text-only um, view of the menu is a must have, right? Otherwise, I have no way of showing my menu. But the images in the gallery view of the menu is the should have, where you know today's special is a could have, it's nice to have. If I don't have it, it's fine. People can always call me. Uh, and I, at this point, I decide I don't want an online ordering system, maybe because I don't have people staffing my, um, my, my digital orders. So in this way, this is a, a prioritization method. Um, we talked about external, meaning I'm communicating my priorities with people who's outside of my team. In this case, I'm communicating with an expert who is going to help me do my website. And then this is uh, toward the qualitative measurements, meaning that I use judgment to determine what are the things that should have, what are the things that could have, what are the things that must have, 
right? I don't have data. I didn't have data to support all of those, but I use my judgment, right? Uh, so this is the, the Moscow method that I think many of you are already familiar with. So this is more or less of a recap. Now, um, when we get into this example, we can see how different they are. So in this case, this is an online furniture store. So let's say um, I am operating an online furniture store and um, I have a list of enhancements that I want to implement on my store. So I'm a product manager. Um, I want to do uh, consider how I prioritize among these features. The first feature is the bought together recommendation. So one customer is looking at a product, then we show them a list of other products that's commonly bought together, a typical recommendation feature. And then we can do a follow-up email after card abandonment. It shouldn't be card, but card abandonment. If customer added stuff to card, then we can uh, do a follow-up to say, did you forget to check out things like that? Uh, and then we can introduce a functionality to allow customers to compare features between different items, uh, like the bat frame or my cabinet. What are the differences between them? We can give the ability of adding items to a wish list so that I'm not ready to buy, but I can add them to my wish list. And we can add a feature to allow people viewing uh, the furniture in their own rooms using augmented reality. It's a fancy feature um, that can work on their phone by leveraging the, the camera. We can introduce a four hour delivery window notification. Instead of saying that your furniture will be delivered today, we can give them a window of four hours so they can plan better when they should be home receiving the furniture. And then uh, we might want to increase the website speed and uh, make it easier to browse for our customers. Um, and finally, we can implement some tracking on the catalog. So this is helping us get more data, get more insights um, for our future operations. So if you look at this list, what's special about this list is that um, it's a list of many things. They belong to different categories. They uh, talk about different natures. Some of those are customer facing. Some of those are not. Some of those have a higher impact. And some of those have lower or uh, less obvious impact. So in this case, how would you prioritize this one? There are different methods you can choose from. Um, but for now, uh, I'm going to use feature buckets. So I'm going to assign labels to them based on the discussions and based on the judgment I have. For instance, I'm going to call bought together feature as a metric driver or my metric mover. So what that means is that this is likely to increase our metric, whether it's revenue or something else that we care deeply about for our OKRs or goals. Similarly, the card abandonment is a metric driver. Some others are less about metric driving but more of the customer request. For instance, adding items to the wish list, it's very obvious that it's not going to bring immediate revenues, but it's helping customers to um, get better browsing and um, you know, uh, management experiences for um, reviewing, looking at your product. And this is an area when we label at the customer request. Typically, it's something that we hear the customer sentiments very often and that we have enough of quality feedback from customers telling us that they need it. So for now, I label them as customer requests. Uh, those are the features customer would expect typically on your website. And then there are also things like uh, viewing your room like the AR and the four hour delivery window. These are the things I label as customer delight, which means customers are not expecting it today. If you introduce them, it's going to bring a surprise in a nice way to customers. Uh, we call them delight. But if you don't do them, nobody's gonna complain saying, oh, you don't have a view in your room AR feature, because typically you don't have it when you're browsing websites like Amazon. And finally, there's a bucket called strategic. These are the areas of work that maybe harder to measure right now. Maybe those are infrastructure related, or maybe those are the things that would take you a long time to get. But if you don't start right now, then you're missing the opportunity window. So you can label them as strategic. 
And those are the things you do want to do, but they don't have an obvious uh, payoff right away. So when you label it this way, um, think about what you're communicating, right? So in this case, you're communicating the how you're categorizing your stuff and then whether they have impact to your revenue, to your business top line metrics, or whether it's potentially going to satisfy the customers better, or are there things that you want to do as a strategic importance? So in this method, you can see that feature bucket is more of an internal and um, qualitative prioritization method. The reason why the qualitative, again, is because I use my judgment. That judgment doesn't have to be mine alone, but it's due judgment. I might have consulted a few people, um, but essentially all of us use judgment to say, this is either a metrics mover or this is a customer request. Um, I didn't put any data to back it up to say, okay, the metrics mover is going to increase this many um, you know, revenue or whatever, right? So you can't do that, um, but still the judgment of labeling them into each category. And this is also an internal method because um, if you think about this, who you're communicating this with, you're mostly communicating to your internal team, explaining to them why we're doing this um, and then how important they are and then why we're doing it now. You're really uh, typically communicating this to your engineering team or to your design team as you're very close stakeholders of this. So that's a feature bucket. And then it's also very commonly used for edition method in the industry. The next one, um, this is an example um, we probably uh, encounter more often in personal life or in consulting. So let's say uh, I want to remodel my kitchen and there are many things I want to do. The new appliances, new cabinets, new floor tiles or hardwood floors, uh, new ceiling lights, new granite countertop, and I want a new paint on my walls. So my contractor gave me a quote for each item. And then they would add up more than what I can afford. I only have a budget of 1500, uh, but these things would add up more than what I can afford. So in this case, how would I choose? And typically we would choose it by playing some scenarios. Plan A, you know, I can do my appliances with new paint that would add up to 15. Plan B, some smaller items like the tiles, the green light, the granite countertops, and new paint. Plan C, cabinet, tile, and paint, nothing else. Uh, plan D, it's a little bit over my budget. It's 100 over my budget, but I think I can stretch it a little bit by having some of those stuff. So when you're looking at this example, it's really important to think about what you're communicating about. In this case, you're communicating about your preferences of this. Yes, I'm making a choice, but the choice I'm making is communicating my preference. For instance, if I choose plan A, what am I really looking at? I'm communicating my preferences is to solve the big expensive stuff. Versus if I choose the plan B, what I'm doing is um, the tiles, the ceiling lights, the uh, granite countertop, those are the very visible things that um, I probably would uh, use or interact with on a daily basis, right? I'm communicating a different set of preferences. So um, versus plan C, uh, I might be indicating that I want to get really things organized or maybe I am um, prioritizing things that I can see um, um, versus plan D, I can clearly show you that I'm willing to stretch my budget a little bit. So typically, when we're using this method called uh, buy me a feature, when you're doing it with your customers, you are uh, soliciting or eliciting their preferences. So in this case, because I'm doing a project for myself just to do to re, uh, remodel my kitchen, so it's pretty easy this way. But in many cases in, in, the, in the industry, when we're doing something like this, we can end up not either doing plan A, B, C, D, or to go with the itemized stuff. We typically use this method to understand what customers value more and use that to design uh, different offerings. For instance, a lot of those subscription offerings 
you know, when we're trying to determine what to include in tier one versus tier two, then we can use this method called buy me a feature to prioritize among customer requirements or customer needs. So this one, uh, again, this is a buy a feature. Um, as you can see, did we use data? Yes, we used the data. How was the decision made? This is the decision that needs to be made by both externals and internals because the external is providing the data, right? The external is saying, you know, what item costs what, how much, and I am deciding how I want to come up with a plan. So that's where buy me a feature is in between external versus internal. It's more leaning towards external because the, the prices are determined by external. So in the real case for building product, then the cost might be determined. For instance, your team would tell you, or some other team would tell you that, um, hey, this is the costing maybe you know three story points, uh, or maybe this is the costing eight story points, and that you can choose between those ones. And this is a little bit uh, quantitative, right? So we do have the data supporting us on um, the um, how much each item costs, but it's not the most of quantitative because we only got the cost. We didn't get the importance from measurement. If we can both get an importance and get the cost, then it would go up to a more quantitative measurement. But this is the sitting in the middle. Buy a feature is also um, very commonly used, not only for product prioritization, but also for, uh, in general, interviewing with customers and getting their preferences. So within, uh, with, not within, with those three examples that we just walked through, uh, I would love you to think about what are the common challenges we have in these prioritization methods. So common, common challenges would include things like we don't have um, enough of data. So data is insufficient. Sometimes we don't have data at all. So we would have to choose a internal and quantitative, uh, qualitative method instead of any quantitative, right? So it's actually when you're doing MVP and you're under a very tight timeline, then typically you don't have enough of data there. You can do market research um, in some cases, but not always. Alignment. Uh, in most cases, we need alignment with both internal and external stakeholders, which is really important. What are the methods that helps you to do? Um, do you have more weight on internal voices, or do you have more weight on the external resource, uh, external stakeholders? That's another challenge, and then to a factor to consider. How do you balance between those alignments? And uh, we also have blind spots. Sometimes we fail to consider those um, measurements or factors that not revenue or not engineering. For instance, you know, we talk about site speed. Site speed is super important for customers. If your site, your, your page takes, I would say, 30 seconds to load up, think about the impact. Most customers would just churn. They would just abandon your page upon landing because these days, most customers only have that much patience. They will not wait, uh, stay there and wait for a page to load. So we all have some blind spots. And in other cases, some design factor can easily either increase or decrease your scope. So we don't want to, um, we don't want to neglect those information. Project nature varies. So the reason why I showed you all the three different examples is a way of illustrating different projects have different uh, natures. And then depending on your particular situation, you should probably consciously choose a prioritization method instead of using a consistent one that you have between you working on a product that's only for your company and all your customers are your internal employees versus when you're working as a consultant for external companies, then your presentation method probably should vary because uh, you're communicating different things, the decision makers are all very different, and the criteria for determining those priorities would be different as well. So um, the last method I want to show you is my favorite. It's an adaptation of value versus cost uh, this method is called importance versus difficulty. The reason why I use it more often than any of these other methods is because uh, it's the framework that helps me balance between those challenges. So 
when between the time I have sufficient data versus the time I, I don't, I can use importance difficulty. Um, between the time I have to, uh, I have a very small team, I'm completely just aligning internal with my team versus the time I'm actually aligning and soliciting parties from external parties, I can use importance versus difficulty. It's also some, it's also a method that you can include different functions from design, from finance, from sales, from marketing. They can all be included if you want to go fancy with that to help us eliminate those blind spots. And then finally, um, all of those factors are saying that between different project natures, we can use this framework and then you can dial it up and or dial it down depending the available factors in your project. So I'm going to show you how that framework works and then do a little bit of exercise uh, to show the logistics and then to get an idea how you can deal it up or deal with them. So uh, this is called importance versus difficulty or in the previous periodic table, it's called value versus cost, same idea, just different naming. So this method is an interactive group proposition method. It's important because it's interactive. You, you have to do it in the live session. It doesn't work that well when you're doing it asynchronously and if you're doing it offline, it doesn't work that well. It also doesn't work that well when you're doing it just by yourself. If you are you're the only person who decides on the priority, then use some others like stack ranking, feature bucket, that tends to work better. But when you have a list of stakeholders, you want to have an interactive session that importance versus difficulty work super well. This also focuses on the understanding and alignment. What that means is that during this interactive session, you're trying to truly understand each other's point of view. Why do you think this is more important? You are putting the potential questions, conflicts, the doubts on the table, and you're trying to also solve it and align on the priorities during this session. So that's another factor uh, for this method. And finally, you can, like I mentioned, you can use a really, really straightforward, a simple importance difficulty matrix, or it can be really sophisticated. You can have multiple factors and that when your project um, gets really big. There are times that I had to do this exercise with people, with a team of 30 or 40, and it still works. It can definitely scale up. And um, let's take a look at maybe one example using this method. So, Let's try to revisit this one. This is the case two we talked about using feature buckets, right? So previously we um, talked about all those different work items and then labeled them with the bucket in the uh, in the feature bucket method. And now um, we don't want to use these feature buckets anymore in this exercise. Instead, we will use the important uh, versus difficulty matrix. So. Let me switch my browser tab and then show you how it looks. Uh, I'm going to put all of those bullet points into stickies in my canvas. All right, here we go. So uh, I'm using this tool called Miro. You can use any whiteboard or you can use Miro. Uh, either way, uh, there are different tools you can do that. I'm also using a template from the Luma Institute. Luma Institute has a lot of design thinking methods you can use, and then they have this really good importance difficulty matrix template that you can borrow uh, if you're you're on uh, mural. So in this example, I put all of those features from the um, online furniture store project into this canvas. So card abandonment, comparison, wish list, view in your room, delivery notification, site speed, catalog tracking, and vault together feature. So now when we have this list, what I want to do is eventually I want to be able to plot all of these into this two by two matrix. On the horizontal axis, it's talking about the importance of them. On the vertical axis, it's talking about difficulty of them. So once we plot them into this two by two, what you can do is that you can either go by the quadrant or you can draw a curve to determine what are the things you want to work on first? I'll show you about how to draw the curve, but you can um, you can do it in other ways as well. So let's first take a look at how you 
Fry has, how you actually put all the different stories into uh, these sections on the, on the matrix. So the first thing is that um, I will need to do a stack ranking of those by importance. So essentially plotting all of them onto my horizontal axis. So let's say um, I'm meeting with you guys. This is in the meeting, and it's an interactive session. Each time, I only want to move one sticky, and I, I want to ask around and hear all my stakeholders' point of views in terms of the relative importance between them. For instance, I'm going to clone this sticky and then say, OK, between buy bought together feature and, let's say, catalog tracking, which one is more important in your point of view? And why in that case? Some people might say, you know, bought together is more important because um, it's going to bring more revenue. Some other people would argue that catalog tracking is more important because if we don't have it, it's garbage in, garbage out. But after a little bit of debate, we can always settle between these two where we should uh, where we should land relatively between those. Um, this is the case where we are already prioritizing on this, even though I don't have perfect data. Right? In this case, I don't have the numeric measurement on these, but I'm still using a um, quantitative hybrid qualitative measurement on this to um, compare the relative importance between them. Now I move on to the next one, saying that, okay, site speed, is that more important than catalog training, less important? Um, and then we can debate a little bit and decide that we want to um, put them in, put that one in the middle this way, and then go with a less further side of vacation, um, and then talk about where where does that fit? Again, each time you're only talking about one sticky, and in this case, I'm putting it to the very uh, the least important among these four. And viewing your room, it's also less important. The wish list, uh, let's say I got some data from customer saying they really want it, so I'm putting it over here. And then comparison feature, the customer also really want it, but we thought that this might be behind the um, site speed because if your site speed is is really slow, then people wouldn't be using your site that that often to do a comparison, right? So those are the reasons. And then card abandonment, these are something that can really bring up a lot of revenue. Um, and I'm putting it over here. So in this exercise, what you can see is that I'm prioritizing um, my revenue and customers, right? So that revenue com comes first, and then it's customer. I'm deprioritizing some of the delights in the previous prioritization example. Um, whether I call it explicitly during this exercise to say the delight or not, uh, you can still understand, you know, like the AR feature is kind of a delight in the pre previous method. So now I have that ranked this list by importance. So what I'm going to do is that I will move this onto my canvas. You only do you only need to do it in the relative um, location. So what I'm gonna do is uh, the align them a little bit. Align it in the right top and distribute that. Okay, looking good. Let's do this again using difficulty. So coming back to this area, the same, the very same stories or stickies. Let's try it by difficulty. Again, coming from the bottom, um, bought together feature, is that more difficult or less difficult comparing to the catalog tracking? I think catalog tracking is less difficult than bought together because it's a larger uh, engineering effort. So I'm putting it up here. Site speed, is that more important, more difficult or less difficult? It's definitely more difficult than tracking because this needs to optimize quite a few things. There might be low handing fruit uh, we can do, such as combining the style sheets, whatever. So this is the, the reason why, again, this is the interactive process is that you want to hear your team. You want to eliminate your blind spots as much as possible by you know hearing people through and then 
uh, just because you're putting them here very visual, like people would raise their hand by saying, I disagree, and this is why I disagree. So this interactive group exercise is going to give you that room and that space to hear other people out and that to use a very uh, concise period of time to do a little debate. So I'm just putting it here for now as demonstration and delivery notification. I would say this is super difficult because the four hour window requires a lot of third party tracking and dependencies. So very difficult view in your room. Really, really, it's an AR, a new technology. My team hasn't even done that before. Uh, it's the most difficult among this list. Wish list looks fairly easy. So I'm going to be putting that above flight speed because it's just adding a lot, it feels easy. And comparison, this is probably um, more difficult than bought together because this has to, you have to do taxonomy and metadata management between different products and then, um, and you have to determine when you can do comparison and when you cannot. Finally, card abandonment looks pretty easy actually because it's just uh, capturing the data and, um, send out an email, but still maybe more difficult than wish list. Okay, putting it here. Alrighty, now I have another list. This is uh, ranked by difficulty. The higher it is, the more difficult uh, the, uh, the story is. Now, let me just put it over here, move it into um, this matrix again. Okay, back here. I have the same stories, both ranked horizontally and vertically. What I now need to do is just, uh, I need to, just move all of those stickies uh, either or another way or vertically to the position um, corresponding to um, our ranking over here. So let's say view in your room, I'm going to just move it over here um, and get rid of this one. Delivery notification, I'm moving it over here. And catalog tracking, where is that? Oh, okay, here it is. I'm just getting rid of this. Comparison feature is here. Size speed is here. And the wish list here. And part abandonment is right over here. And the pop together is over here. All righty. So now we have ranked the relative importance and difficulty of these ones. So uh, you have a choice to make now. Sometimes, depending on the nature of your project, sometimes you want to draw a curve this way. Let's say you want to draw a curve this way to say these are the most important and most difficult ones, essentially your big rock. You want to tackle them first. And then you want to draw your next curve this way so that um, you can move on to the next wave of things. So that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is from the lower right corner. Let me try that as well. So sometimes what you want to do is to say that, okay, we want to optimize the go-to-market. I don't want to tackle those big rocks, actually. The most important ones, I probably want to tackle them uh, last. So, or not last, but on the second wave. So MVP are typically that type of exercise. What you want to do is to say, Okay, let me just work on these ones first. I want to draw a curve here, the most important but least difficult ones. And then I want to move on to the second tier, which is the, the more important but also more difficult ones. And finally, we want to work on the, uh, the least important but most difficult ones. Or maybe you never go to this area because those are just so difficult and you would have some rolling items into the first tier and second tier. So all of those are the different ways you can do um, you can draw the curve, and this is the exercise that's a little more artistic than scientific, but you get the point, right? So you can determine whether you want to focus on the big rock versus the low hanging fruit. Alrighty, so that's a quick view about the prioritization method for importance difficulty. Um, I just to show you how it looks, and then a quick recap about this one. The important difficulty matrix is an interactive group prioritization prioritization method to focus on understanding and alignment. It can be really simple and sophisticated. So in the example we just walked through, the we only look at the relative importance for based on the group exercise, right? So if you have a group of four or five, it works really well for stress talk through. But what if you have a group of 30? 
So in that case, what you want to do is that you can divide importance into different factors and have different sessions. For instance, you can have a session with sales and marketing team. Again, that smaller group of five to talk about the revenue impact for, um, for your importance. And then you can have another section with your designers, with your customer service team to talk about customer impact for that. So for the importance, you can have different factors and then have different smaller sessions and then roll it up. As long as you guys can agree to say, okay, revenue is one third of the weight and then customer value is one third of the weight and maybe something strategic is one third of the weight. As long as you can agree upon that, then you can still come up with a stacked ranking list of importance after you do those separate exercises. Similarly, difficulty, typically you want to consider what is the cost of building it, what is the cost of doing operations, meaning maintaining it and operationalize it, and what are the costs of doing change management. Some of those features are not difficult to build, but it's very difficult to socialize be, uh, inside of your company uh, just because the sheer amount of people that's going to affect, right? So you want to consider those as your difficulty. Again, dividing that into smaller sessions and and with different stakeholder groups can give you a, the ability of making it more sophisticated and then ramp up this matter. So that's the reason why I really like this importance and the difficulty matrix. And also, like I mentioned, depending on whether you have data, we have some data in customer request area or some, some data in revenue area, you can use it for a particular factor, right? So for some other areas, when you don't have that data, as long as you can agree with that small smaller group agree upon the relative importance, you can see you get the ranking working. Um, so this is a pretty versatile approach. Alrighty, so for this session, some of the key, key takeaways, um, there is no one size fits all prioritization method like we looked at. Depending on your team setup, your own company situation, and who you're prioritizing with, you should consciously choose a method that fits your situation best. Two, when quantitative data isn't available, qualitative data can also help, like the stack ranking with a smaller stakeholder. What this does is that it makes alignment among the experts. For instance, you can get a really, really good idea about their uh, relative importance or this relative stack ranking for revenue with your sales and marketing people. Typically, that smaller group will give you a really good idea how that works. So reduce your risk by using that qualitative data. And then prioritization exercise is about understanding and alignment. In every case we walk through, uh, think about who you are communicating, what information do you need from the other party, and what information you're giving back and how the decision will be made, right? So that's a very important factor for you to choose and, and um, prioritization method. So as a next step, I would really encourage you to do a few things. One, um, now you have some more knowledge about different ways of prioritizing. So pick one of your current or your past roadmaps and look at all the items on it. And then think about whether there is a different prioritization method you would try with it. And if you do, then do you have enough data? What do your stakeholder look like? And how would you, what method would you choose differently? And then think about what is your primary challenge you want to solve for the predation. Are you to trying to optimize the resources? Are you trying to uh, get your stakeholders aligned? Or are you trying to do something else, right? Satisfy your customers. Depending on your need, and you might want to choose a different method. And finally, if you find this helpful, please share this webinar with one person, just the one person, uh, at least one person uh, who can benefit from it. Um, because I feel the more, the more you align on uh, how you prioritize, the more you have a common language or common approach to prioritize, the better place we are on producing our roadmap. Alrighty, this is the uh, end of the webinar and thank you all for attending it. Um, I appreciate your participation and I hope this was uh, helpful. Have a good rest of your day. Bye, folks.